Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday evening series. We've been looking for the last week or two at the subject of God is God. And the idea there was that when God laid aside his glory to come and humble himself and become a man, he was still God. And so we looked at that this God who laid aside his glory. Tonight, though, I want to look at why God became man. Why did Jesus become a man? I mentioned uh, in our notes tonight that the incarnation of Christ is like the Mount Everest in human history. Uh, had he not come, we'd be lost in our sin and condemned to the lake of fire. Had he not come, there'd be no plumb line for human behavior, nor definitive understanding of how to relate to God. How he not come, the Bible would just be another book with an inconclusive and unsatisfying ending. Had he not come, we would never be able to know and experience the familial love which has been revealed to us in Christ that we should be called the sons of God, as John put it in 1 John 3, 1. So I want to mention tonight 31 specific things uh, uh, that were reasons why he laid aside his glory and became a man. Now, all of these bear further thought than we're going to give in these few moments together tonight. Uh, and I put some representative scriptures down here to illustrate the point, but uh, you can do further study on your own. The first one was to do the will of the Father. In John 6, 38, Jesus says expressly, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And in Hebrews 10, 7, it says, then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So he came to do the will of the Father. Now we need to stop right there because one of the things that Jesus is telling us in this is that if we're going to be like him, it's got to be our desire to do the will of the Father also. And so in the Son, we see the will of the Father expressed. There's something to ponder right there. Then he laid aside his glory and became man to save sinners. Secondly, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, 1 Timothy 1, 15. Hebrews 9, 26 says, For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So in Luke 19, 10, it says, He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so he came to save sinners. Third, he came to bring light to a, a dark world. In John 12, 46, Jesus says, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. An implicit understanding of that verse is that everybody's in darkness apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in John 15, 22, he said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Why? Because there's the knowledge of their sin uh, revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Then fourth, to be made like his people. In Hebrews 2, uh, 14 to 17, it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For sure, uh, surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So <clears throat> he was to be made like his people. And then fifth, the reason he came was to bear witness to the truth. In John 18, 37, one of the most poignant passages in the Bible, I believe, uh, when Jesus is standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pilate, Pilate said to him, So you are a king, or you are a king, however you want to say that. You say that I am a king, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And clearly in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus came to bear witness to to the truth. In fact, he is the truth. And number six, to destroy the devil and his works. I like this one. Hebrews 2.14. Uh, 
Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of the death, death, that is, the devil. In 1 John 3, 8, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Number seven, to give eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the word, world is my flesh. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Notice, please, it doesn't say going to get life. It says has life. Number eight, to receive worship. Now, this is Matthew 2, 1 to 2, and then verse 11. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We're not sure how many wise men there were, but there were three gifts that they brought. Number nine, to bring great joy. I love this, Luke 2.10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Number 10, to demonstrate true humility. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a serpent, servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Number 11, why did he come? To preach the gospel. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, and then verses 42 to 43. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And then to bring judgment, John 5, 22 and 23. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And then John 9, 39 to 41. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you see say we see your guilt remains verse uh, number 13 to give us life give his life a ransom for many mark 10 45 for even the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many in titus 2 13 to 14 waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. 14. To fulfill the law and the prophets. Matthew 5, 17. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Number 15. To reveal God's love for sinners. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Number 16, to call sinners to repentance. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. 
I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I love that verse because it reminds me that there is no <clears throat> depth to which Christ will not come to reach somebody to tell them the good news about himself. Number 17, to die. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it. <clears throat> life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. John 12, 24 to 27. And I'm going to just pick up on verse uh, 27 here. Uh, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. In other words, Jesus was sent here to die. And we're told, by the way, in Isaiah 53, that it was the Father's good pleasure to put his son to death. Why? Because it was the only way to satisfy the justice of God. 18, as I mentioned the verse earlier in Luke 19, verse 5, and then 9 and 10. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Then he came to serve, number 19. Philippians 2, 7, But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In John 13, 13 to 15. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Number 20, to bring peace. Ephesians 2, 14 to 18. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of, a wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to, in one spirit to the Father. Number 21, he also came to bring a sword. Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now you might think if uh, that sounds contradictory to what we just read that he's going to come and bring peace, but he says he didn't come to bring peace. What he's talking about there is peace like most people think about it. The peace that he came to bring was peace with God. It was to reconcile us to God. But peace among men is a fleeting thing, especially if they've decided in sinfulness to, to abolish one another. Luke 2, 34 and 35, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. I think also of uh, Hebrews 4, when it talks about the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, since Jesus himself is the truth, he is the living word of God, and that, that sword pierces us through and, and knifes right down through the, you know, the truth of who we are. Well, he comes also to, to bind up broken hearts. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful uh, headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, their garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Number 23, to give us the spirit of adoption. John 14, 16 to 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive 
because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And if you read the book of Romans, you'll find a treatise there in the book of Romans on the subject of our being adopted children of God. Number 24, to make us partakers in the, of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. He came also to reign as king. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. John 18, 37, back to that whole dialogue with Jesus when he says, uh, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Number 26, to restore human nature to holiness. And Luke 1, 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When mankind was created, he was created innocent. In other words, he could walk in holiness with God. That ended in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And it was never, ever true again until Jesus was born. When God became man, Jesus made a path so man could be restored to a holy standing before God. Number 27, to be a merciful and faithful high priest. Uh, Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And Hebrews 7, verses 24 to 27. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. 28, to be the second and greater Adam. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. That's Romans 5, 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, by a man has, uh, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You can think of the Bible as a story of two men in a sense. On the one hand, you have the story of Adam who fell, who, who rebelled against God. Everybody who's born in the line of Adam dies, all of them, even Jesus. But then there's the second Adam. Christ himself. He died to do, undo what the first Adam had done. And so it's a story of two Adams, if you will, two men. Then to satisfy our deepest thirst, number 29, uh, John 4, 13 to 14, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
John 7, 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And then number 30, to be loved by God's children. John 8, 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. 1 John 4, 16 to 21. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is the love of God perfected in us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Mm. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And then number 31, why did he come? To reveal God's glory. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 17, verses 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you, that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. There are 31 reasons why Jesus came and the scriptures that bear witness of those 31 things. Oh, I'm sure there are more reasons. that I didn't mean that to be an exhaustive list. But what I meant to do is to demonstrate to you that the God who left heaven, left heaven for reasons. A lot of those reasons have to do with us. Some of them have to do with him. All of them have to do with the Father in heaven. So what I mean to say is that when we come to this time of year, what deepens our and broadens our understanding of what Christmas is really about is a deep and abiding appreciation for who Jesus is and why he came. And what he accomplished on our behalf was that he ransomed us. He bought us. We've been bought at a price, a price that he paid. And even though we mostly talk about that at Easter time, uh, and rightly so because that's when we talk about his death, burial, and resurrection, but when we're thinking about him coming into the world, he knew all of this when he came. And still he came. Now I have to tell you, I've been in many situations in which I sort of knew what the outcome was going to be, and I knew it was going to kind of be bad. I didn't want to go. I hesitated. I hemmed. I hawed. You know, I hedged against doing what I knew I needed to do. But here was one who came willingly, like a Sheep led before the shearers, before the slaughter. He, he knew he was going to die, and yet he came. He was born. He suffered the indignities of becoming a man. Why did he do that? Because he loved. Mm -hmm. Because he loved. So this time of year, when it's a Christmas time, we ought to be thinking about the love that God has shown us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. It ought to humble us. It'll make us deeply appreciate the fact that God did this on our behalf. But it also ought to bring us to the place where we ought to follow in the steps of Christ. Too often I see people who do not walk humbly before their God. This year, let's make a deliberate, determined effort to love God and love others. And why? Because that's the first two great commandments. And we need to do them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and your word tonight. And Lord, this has fundamentally been a lot of scripture reading tonight. I pray, Father, that your word will accomplish what you've purposed it, and it will not return to you empty. Father, 
Be glorified, I pray, Lord. Help us that we might be constantly and ever witnessing to the person about the person of Jesus Christ and testifying to a lost and dying world that there is hope, but it exists only in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for loving us enough to send him. And I would thank you, Father, so much that he came willingly because of love. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us tonight. You can, uh, if you have any questions about what we said, what we read tonight, uh, if you'd like a copy of the transcript of what we read from tonight, you're welcome to have one. Just drop us a line here at the church, Ferris Baptist Fellowship, P.O. Box 203, Ferris, Texas, 75125. Or you can stop by the church at 809 East 8th Street uh, in Ferris, Texas. We'd be love to see you. 8th Street in Ferris is also known as FM 660. Uh, and so if you travel down this way and you're not used to it, you know, just know that that's the case. Uh, or you can call us at 972-544-3564. In any case, it's been fun and enjoyable spending some time with you. Uh, we won't be meeting next Wednesday night, so we'll be missing that Wednesday night. But we'll pick it back up after we come back from our Christmas break. Thank you and have a glorious evening.